going to the session earlier this morning, so I hope everyone remember what white flies are. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Jeremy Perrier, and I am a starting postdoc with the UGA, working with Dr. Shapir Yemen in the USDA Fruit and Tree Nut Lab there. But most of this work is actually from my PhD. So, what I'll be going through today is talking to you about what we did in terms of characterizing insect sour resistance for Georgia as a state. We focus on the southeastern and southern part of Georgia where I first worked. So, for the outline, I'll be going through the evaluating insect sour resistance, white flies at the intersection of polypheggy and insect sour resistance. So post pilot effects we identified, and then I'll also give you a brief introduction into my future direction, managing white flies with some biologicals. So just to let you know again, uh, white flies are highly invasive, they're polyphic and polyphic as pesto vegetables. In Georgia, we do have two main cryptic species, maybe the Middle East minor one, Middle East and Asia minor one, and the Mediterranean. Our seasonal populations are supported by our agricultural crops as well as our long-standing weeds that have some reproductive suitability. And globally, we do have increasing reports of insect sour resistance following some selection pressures, just like consistent use of same chemistries that work or not work is still used in just to control white flies. So for this uh, study, we evaluate the insect sour resistance response and we focus on the adults and there are two main pathways for introduction of insecticides into the adult. It can be from systemic, seeing that this is a systemic feeder using the piercing sucking mop part, but you can also have that contact application as well. We focused on the systemic aspect of this, and typically whenever you're doing an insecticide resistance evaluation, you want to get an LC50, in which you get that median needle concentration that will control 50% of the population. As I said, there are different approaches to evaluating insecticide efficacy for white flies, and we focus on a systemic approach. So how do we do this? Well, we started off with our cotton plants and we read in uh, grow chambers. We used three whole plants. We subjected them to a systemic root drench in which we used two chemicals. Those would be your Exeril and Meyer cyanotronilipril and metaclopril. And we allowed the plants to imbibe the chemicals for 24 hours before we actually used them in our experiments. So while that was happening, we would then do our field collection. When it's time to do the experiment, we use this two apparatus, which is our funnel apparatus there, collect a bunch of adults. We would then transport them back to the lab, allow them to acclimate for a bit. And then when it's time to do the experiment, we would excise the leaf off our treated plants and tuck it into the tube. We would do two mortality counts, an initial count, and then a 24-hour count and then calculate for mortality. So of course, we did have some questions that arise, and one of the first questions that arise when we're doing this adaptive systemic approach is, can we quantify the concentration of the insecticide's active ingredient, and can we also do this to improve the accuracy of biosafe? And the answer to that is yes. This is a recent work that we're working through. It's just got through proof, so it'll be published pretty soon. And uh, what we realized is that with an increase in our systemic root drench concentrations, we had an increase in residue in that leaf tissue but prior to uptake. And then we also had a proportional increase in white fly mortality for our two insecticides. So we're able to then correlate that back and say, okay, we will get this much mortality from that much treatment concentration. And it makes it for a more accurate biosay using our insecticides. So since we confirmed this methodology and we now know that we could utilize this most accurately, we also went ahead and surveyed some counties in Georgia. Field by field monitoring is still the most accurate approach to <coughs> looking at insecticide efficacy, especially for white flies. So we did a survey across 10 counties, including um, four research farms and six commercial farms. And this went on from 2021 to 22. And we also included into this survey two counties from North Florida, as well as our two laboratory colonies. So what we found was that for imidacloprid, we expected it to be resistant right across the board as that's what we're also seeing here in Florida. And that's one of the reasons why we included Florida in our survey is because most of our insecticide profiles are actually based on the Florida data that we have here. Surprisingly, we identified two locations that were susceptible to immunoclobin. So moving forward, we might start using our own insecticide profiles just for these evaluations. In contrast for cyanotronic pro, we were expecting a broad susceptibility across the board but instead, we found some locations that were 
distributing some level of resistance to it, as well as some resistant populations as well. So it's not necessarily uniform across the board, and this is something that can change annually, which is why you want to do that field by field applications, as well as annual applications, just to make sure you're retaining efficacy to your insecticides. So this is also showing that a bit. For the two insecticides that we tested, we looked at them across the years. Uh, just for a quick look, the green dots are gonna be at 2021, that gray line is gonna be at 22, the red dots are gonna be your lab colony from 22, and the blue dots are gonna be from 2021 for your lab colony. So for both insecticides, we realized that there was a shift towards more resistance as the years progressed. For immunoclover, there was more of a homogeneous response in terms of the insecticide, and that's just saying that you're getting more of a uniform response for your treatments for that insecticide. One of the things that we also identified was for our colonies, we had relatively a uniform response, we got more homogeneity across the, the populations, but we also noticed a shift towards resistance in terms of our two populations as the years went by. For imidacloprid, surprisingly, we noticed that there was a shift towards more homogeneity for our lab population. That's something that you expect whenever you have, like you're starting off with a colony, you want to shift towards that more homogeneous response, mainly because then you have more of an accurate approach when you're doing your comparisons for susceptibility. So to conclude this survey, Overall, cyanotrinopole still remains an effective option for Georgia populations, despite the fact that we do have some concerns about resistance being developed. Immunoclopic control was not as expected. We identified some susceptible locations, but we were able to pull this data together to create some baseline data for the state, and this is also new for the state as well. So we compared this to our Florida data, both for our own colony as well as an historical colony. For cyanotrinopole, we, despite the fact that we have that increasing resistance, uh, it is susceptible for the most part, and in comparison to our Florida population that we surveyed, it is way more susceptible. Similarly, for imidacloprid, in comparison to our Florida population, we realized that despite the fact that we had high resistance, we are still susceptible in comparison to Florida. So, monitoring populations across regional landscapes may help to at least help us evaluate the progression of resistance, especially if we take into consideration the dispersal of these populations and how that might affect resistance development. Some other projects that we're looking at that focus on insecticide efficacy is a maximum dose biosay for assessing insecticide response, and that's pairing a high labor rate with a low labor rate to see if we can also detect resistance using that low labor rate before we do an actual field application. We're looking at the overposition rate and how that's impacted by insecticides as well. We have some annual efficacy reports that are coming out. And we're looking at a biosafety development that included some of the methodology that I mentioned earlier. And this is going to be a rapid biosafety in which we can use before we do our field applications. We're also testing for some known genetic mechanisms of resistance, looking at some P450s, and we're coming up with a diagnostic tool in which we can use to survey our populations to also determine resistance likelihood before we do our field applications. So, uh, just to switch gears a bit, we spoke a bit about insecticide resistance, and as you know, as Dr. Simmons stated earlier, white flies are very polyphagous. We have a wide host range of them that includes weeds and crops. And we looked at this Venn diagram just to see that we have the overlap of each individual. We have polyphagy between the host plant and the white flies, insecticide resistance between the insecticide and the white fly, and likely a reaction between host plant and insecticide. But what happens when you have all three of these overlapping together? And that's one of the main projects that when focuses that we had for my PhD program, just to see what would happen if we have all three being incorporated. So to evaluate this, we looked at the host plant, and we started with a parent population that was just on cotton and squash. What we did was we biased that parent population so that we would know the dose response at that specific point. We then subjected the population to host plant feeding, in which we did either 48 hour feeding or we established a cage population and used the F3 population for the experiment. We would then biosay those populations and then do a comparison for those response. We did the same thing in the field aspect in which we planted four different crops, we biosay them and then we compared them to see if there was any difference between them. And we did this utilizing the same methodology as we did for the survey. 
So to focus on San Junipero for this talk, uh, we found that there was susceptibility that was influenced by the host. So there are instances in which we had different variations in terms of mortality of white flies in comparison to the host that they were feeding on. So like for example, in the cage rearing, we had higher mortality in cucumber, we had lower mortality in, in uh, the cotton. And then that yellow, that white bar right there, which says makes is your starting <coughs> colony, that would be your parent population which we started at. So as you can see that there is a shift in terms of whether you have increase in mortality or reduction in mortality from the parent population due to host feeding. We also saw this in the field populations in which there were differences in terms of whichever host the white flies are feeding on, and that also influenced their mortality as a result of exposure to the insecticide. However, for 48 hour feeding, we didn't have much of a separation in terms of mortality. And we we're thinking that that was mainly because 48 hours are just too early to actually do the evaluation. It was just too quick for host effects to actually take over. So to conclude, insecticide dose response in Demisitabasi is influenced by its host, and resistance, once it's established, overshadows its host. And for that, I'm speaking specifically to the other insecticide in which we tested, which was immunocloprid. For immunocloprid, we were unable to detect major host effects, and that was mainly because the population itself was already resistant to the insecticide. And as a result, we didn't have much host effects as a, as a result. And we're thinking that a reproductive host selection could be more complex when you're considering insecticide exposure. And to evaluate that, we think if you consider crop rotation to see if we're moving from a susceptible host that had a more susceptible insecticide dose response to it to a host that would probably decreases mortality and makes it more resistant, how does that affect the whole reproductive host selection for white flies as well? So uh, to switch gears again, now this part is a new aspect which I'm taking on for my postdoc, and it's looking at managing white flies with biologicals. And the question mark is there because we're working with nematodes and white flies. So we're looking at working with entomopathogenic fungi, of course, there are more than 20 species documented so far. The most common would be a Bavaria bassiana. We also have some endorizing species, and of course your cordyceps. Uh, for this one, we'll be looking at the Cordyceps germanica, specifically a strain that was recently identified in the Shapir Inland Lab. And we'll also be looking at nematodes and focusing more on the standard tip nematodes as well as the heterogeny tips. And what we're looking to get into for that is its compatibility with insecticides. We will be looking at the virulence of the metabolites of the EPNs and uh, how does that synthesize same uh, the bacteria effect on white flies. And of course, we'll be looking at that new strain I spoke about for the cordyceps germanico. So I do like to thank you all for listening. A uh, few funding parties in which i like to acknowledge as well, University of Georgia, the USDA managing white flies and white fly transmitted viruses in vegetable, and it's in the crops in the southeastern US grants, as well as the Georgia Commodity and Vegetable Growers. I'd like to acknowledge, of course, some of my committee members, Dr. Champagne, Dr. Sparks, Dr. Smith, and uh, the UGA faculty and staff personnel, as well as the other lab technicians that we had within our vegetable lab, our postdoc, and uh, as well as some new person that I'll be working with with that nematode and fungi aspect as well. Do you have any questions? Okay. Any questions for Jamie?